Honorol huddled in the corner with the other accused boys, trying to keep warm. The guards were coming. Who would they take this time? Rough hands suddenly dragged Honorol to the center of the room. The trapdoor slid open and he fell down, down, down into the judging room. A sharp pain shot up Honorol's left ankle as he landed on the floor. For a moment, he couldn't breathe. He blinked, trying to adjust to the dim light. A guard loosened Honorol's tied hands. Honorol's eyes stung as blood rushed into his numb fingers. The judge recited the accusations against him, disturbing the peace and consorting with the devil to kill Frau Wagner's cow. Honorol cried, professing his innocence, but they didn't listen. He fought against the guards, but they simply picked him up and carried him into the torture room. Honorol was chained to the rough stone wall. A guard held him down as another guard pulled a branding iron out of the fire. The soft flesh of Honorol's cheek sizzled as the burning hot metal pressed against it. His stomach heaved. He thought he might throw up from the pain and the smoky smell of his cooking flesh. The guard dribbled a little water onto Honorol's burned cheek, offering the merest bit of relief. The guard tipped Honorol's face up to meet his and stared him in the eyes. Tell me, what do you know of the magician jackals? Welcome to Haunted Places. I'm Greg Polson. Every Thursday, I take you to the scariest, eeriest, most haunted, real places on Earth. This week, join me on a supernatural journey to the eerie witch's castle in Salzburg, Austria, and discover why, to this day, it's haunted. Listen to more episodes of Haunted Places, as well as ParCast's other podcasts, on your favorite podcast directory. We're also on Facebook and Instagram, at ParCast, on Twitter, at ParCast Network, and at ParCast.com. Many of you have asked how you can support Haunted Places. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is to leave a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. The Salzburg province of Austria is known for its lovely alpine landscape. Beyond the amazing natural beauty, many tourists are drawn to the area for its stunning architecture and rich history. About one and a half hours from the capital of Salzburg city, a medieval relic has stood for over 800 years. Perched on a rocky point overlooking the verdant Moor Valley, looms the forbidding, windswept Musham Castle. Musham is a spur castle, standing on a ridge which rises about 3,500 feet over the surrounding countryside. It's virtually inaccessible from two sides and built to withstand long sieges. Due to its long and bloody history of imprisonment and torture of witches, Musham is nicknamed the Witch's Castle. Some visitors have had encounters with the supernatural, suggesting that the castle continues to imprison the wretched souls who were once persecuted there. Although no one knows when Musham Castle was built, it first appeared in records in 1191. The castle was originally owned by the noble Musheimer family. In the late 13th century, the property was seized by the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg and turned into a regional seat of power a role it served throughout the Middle Ages. By the 1600s, Musham Castle consisted of three courtyards surrounded by a maze of rooms, including a huge stable, a granary, a dining hall, and two towers. In addition to hallways, a series of wooden external walkways lined the courtyards, connecting most of the castle. The outer walls of the castle were constructed from hard white stone, harvested from a Roman settlement that formerly stood on the site. 
Musham Castle meted out both judgment and punishment through its courtroom and tower prison. The court handled all sorts of cases, including poaching, adultery, fraud, and witchcraft. Often, prisoners were tortured to extract confessions. One such confession touched off an extremely dark period in Austrian history. The icy water hit Barbara, pulling her back to consciousness. A groan escaped from her cracked lips. She would not confess. She hung, wrists raw and bloody from the shackles, arms pulled behind her back, the steady burn of muscles stretching with every heartbeat as her shoulders were slowly pulled from their sockets. She had told the truth. She wasn't guilty of anything. Barbara squirmed, trying to ease the pressure, but it didn't help. Her arms, neck, back, her whole body was one big throbbing ache. She had begged, pleaded for mercy. But they knew she had cursed the innkeeper and that his son had fallen ill. They believed she was a witch. A guard kicked Barbara, causing the chains her shackles dangled from to twist. A hand grasped her ankle. Something hot and stinging suddenly stabbed into the tender flesh under the nail of her big toe. The acrid smell of sulfur hit her nose. Barbara kicked weakly, trying to dislodge the burning sulfur stick, but she held her tongue. She was not a witch and would not confess to being one. Barbara twisted her neck. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see the doorway. The guards were dragging a prisoner across the rough stone floor. Paul! She had thought him dead, but here he was, bound and gagged, his dear face bruised, his eyes nearly swollen shut. She hadn't seen him since they were arrested. She watched in horror as they laid Paul down on the wooden stretching bench. They extended his arms and legs tying his wrists and ankles to the four corner posts. Paul's body grew taut. He groaned as his arms and legs began to pull in opposite directions. Eventually, he would be ripped apart. Stomach heaving, Barbara twisted against her chains. A guard leered at her and she understood. They would make Paul pay for her defiance. Barbara's mind raced. If they wanted to know about witchcraft, she'd give them a story about witchcraft. She wouldn't confess for her sake, but Paul's. Words burst from her lips. In 1675, a beggar woman named Barbara Kohler and her partner, Paul Kaltenpacher, were arrested for harassing a Salzburg businessman when he would not give them alms. Angry with his lack of charity, Barbara cursed him. Soon after, when his son mysteriously fell ill, Barbara and Paul were forcefully questioned by authorities. Barbara confessed to officials that her son from a previous relationship, also named Paul, Paul Jacob Kohler, had made a pact with the devil. Even more worrying was Barbara's admission that Paul Jacob, or Magician Jackals, as he came to be known, was a Fagan-esque leader of a bunch of beggar children to whom he was teaching black magic. At the time, the Salzburg area was suffering through a famine due to unusually cold weather. Economic anxiety plagued the region. A devil worshiper uniting the droves of starving beggar children around Salzburg city. If authorities didn't nip this disturbance in the bud, it might end society as they knew it. Unfortunately for Barbara, the story was all for naught. She and Paul were soon executed after her confession, and the authorities set out on a nasty witch hunt, which came to be known as the Salzburg Witch Trials. Though the authorities searched high and low, they never seemed to catch magician jackals. The rumors about him 
heard mainly through the torture-induced confession of his alleged followers, were wild. Magician Jackals was favored by Satan himself and practiced blood rituals. He could fly a pitchfork. Using a special ointment, he could turn himself invisible or into a werewolf. He could cause illness and command swarms of pests to do his bidding. Magician Jackals taught his devoted followers to harness the power of the black arts. Moritz hated coming down to the dungeon. There is a certain miasma to the air, sickly, unwashed bodies, but also despair. Moritz jumped as he almost stepped on something furry. Ugh, he hated rats. Moritz blinked, adjusting to the permanent gloom of the jail cells. Other than his torch, the only light came from a single small high window in the damp stone wall. Moritz sat down the rough wooden trencher of scraps for the prisoners. The crowd of boys fell on the food, shoving and fighting to get something in their bellies. Moritz watched them, his lip curled. He could have ladled out portions so each prisoner got a share, but where was the fun in that? They would soon all be dead anyway. They were guilty, devotees of the magician jackals. Their souls had already belonged to the devil. What did it matter if they starved? An older brawny teen slapped a frail boy out of the way and scooped up the last bite of food. Moritz chuckled as he picked up the trencher. Filthy beggars, animals all. The next day, the same. The bigger prisoners shoved the smaller boys out of the way and took the lion's share of the food. The frail boy had a giant bruise on his cheek. He hardly got anything to eat. The same the next day. The boy's cold eyes glared hatefully at Moritz as he picked up the empty trencher. Moritz grinned back. The next day, the frail boy huddled in the corner of the cell, not even fighting for his share of scraps. He was holding something. Moritz came closer and shuddered. A rat was licking the frail boy's bloody fingers as he murmured to it. Moritz raised his torch. On the wall and the floor surrounding the boy, he could see strange symbols written in blood. Through cracked lips, the boy bared his teeth at Moritz in a travesty of a smile. Jackals comes for you. His voice was raspy, hoarse from disuse. Though Moritz didn't believe in magic, that night he still had trouble falling asleep. Something furry scurried underfoot, catching Moritz by surprise. He fell, dropping his torch. It fizzled out, plunging him into near darkness. The trencher flipped, dousing him in gravy and food scraps. Moritz tried to move, but his leg was definitely broken. He yelled for help but was met with the jeering of the prisoners. That's when he felt the first bite, a sharp nip on his finger. He shooed the rat away, but, oh God, there was something clawing up his pants leg and one biting his shoulder. Suddenly, he was being bitten everywhere. The rats were vicious, fearless, hungry. Eventually, someone came looking for Moritz. They found his mutilated body on the stairs, blood oozing from hundreds of tiny rat bites. His eyes were missing. The rats found the soft parts delicious. The new guard, hearing the rumors about Moritz's horrible death, was kinder to the prisoners. Many of the Salzburg witch trial prisoners were sent to Musham Castle. The majority were tortured prior to their execution through burning, decapitation, or hanging. 
By the time the hysteria over the magician jackals had died down, 139 people had been executed. 39 were children, between 10 and 14 years old. 53 were young adults, between 15 and 21. Unusual for witch hunts during this time, more males than females were executed, 113 males in all. The youngest victim executed during the Salzburg witch trial was 10-year-old Honoral, and the oldest was 80-year-old Margareta Reinberg. All of the victims except two were orphans or beggars. While Paul Jacob Kohler definitely existed, his secret identity as a black magic leader was never proven to be more than a rumor. In all the years of the investigation, the authorities never found any trace of magician jackals. Our story will continue in a moment, right after the break. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. Parcast New Mythology Podcast dramatizes ancient myths for a modern audience and dives into their history, origins, and meaning. Hosted by my friend Vanessa Richardson, Mythology uses an ensemble cast to bring these stories to life. Every episode dramatizes an exciting story pulled from the beliefs of ancient cultures and gives insight into how our ancestors saw the universe. Stick around after this episode to hear a preview of Mythology's Part 1 on the Greek goddess Athena. New episodes come out every Tuesday. Search for and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. It's not a ParCast podcast, but if you like haunted places, I think you might like The Horror of Dolores Roach, a new horror fiction podcast I found. The Horror of Dolores Roach tells a macabre urban legend of murder, betrayal, weed, gentrification, cannibalism, and survival of the fittest. When Dolores Roach returns to her old New York City neighborhood after 16 years in prison, she's stunned by all that's changed. The only person remaining from her previous life is Luis, an old stoner friend who gives her room and board in the basement underneath his dilapidated empanada shop. When the promise of her newfound stability is quickly threatened, Magic Hands Dolores is driven to extremes to survive. The Horror of Dolores Roach stars Daphne Rubin Vega and Bobby Cannavale and is written by Aaron Mark. I think it's a great podcast, but don't take my word for it. Refinery29 says, The Horror of Dolores Roach stands out from the rest. It's totally fictional, but still equally chilling. You can listen to all episodes of The Horror of Dolores Roach now for free, wherever you get your podcasts. Now, the story continues. Even after the hysteria of the Magician Jackal's investigation died down, Musham Castle continued to imprison and execute people for witchcraft. Quite often, those accused of witchcraft were in a place of vulnerability and subservient to their accuser. It's rumored that the secretly pregnant mistress of a church official or two was executed here as a witch. In the mid-1700s, the prisoners of Musham were overseen by a man named Eitan Heilmeyer, generally called Warden Tony, or Henchman Tony, behind his back. Warden Tony lived on site at the castle, 
and is said to have taken a particular pleasure in torturing prisoners, but is until one summer's night in 1775. Tony turned over in his bed. For several days, he hadn't been sleeping well. Usually, he didn't think about the prisoners, but the violent death of this girl had disturbed him. He heard the watchman call 2 a.m. It was not long until the witching hour. He forced himself to close his eyes. The girl was young, no more than 15, and she was accused of being the devil's handmaiden. She pled, clutching her round belly, begging for mercy, at least until the babe was born. The judges pulled out the judging sword. Etched into each side of the sword was an image, one of a hangman's noose, the other of horses. They turned the horse side up. The girl screamed as Tony tied the rope around her wrists. Another guard did the same with her feet. Tony slapped the horse's rump. The horses walked forward. At some point, the girl wasn't able to scream anymore. She had gone into early labor. Her limbs were ripped from their sockets. Tony woke, drenched in sweat, struggling to breathe, tangled in a sea of blankets. His dreams were getting worse. Tony threw on a dressing gown. He needed to get some air. Nodding to the passing night sentry, Tony stood on the bulwark, still unsettled by his nightmare. That's when he saw the light traveling across the floor of the valley. It had to be a carriage racing toward the winding road that led up to Castle Musham. Tony got a bad feeling in the pit of his stomach. He didn't know why, but he was sure whoever was in the carriage was coming to see him. All too soon, the carriage arrived at Castle Musham. The wooden gates swung open on their own, and an expensive black carriage driven by four huge coal-black stallions thundered into the main courtyard. Tony resisted the urge to run and hide. An icy chill went down his spine. The horses had glowing red eyes. A pale, expressionless driver opened the carriage door, and a handsome young gentleman in a coat of black superfine stepped out. He caught sight of Tony and smiled. Something about a smile was unpleasant, like a cat smiling at a mouse before pouncing, thought Tony. The handsome young man removed his black gloves, reached into his breast pocket, and pulled out a small scroll. With a flourish, he unrolled it and held it out to Tony. He snapped his fingers and a small flame appeared, cupped in the center of his hand. Tony bent forward to read the scroll. With sickening clarity, he suddenly remembered a brash bargain he made on a drunken evening long ago. Tony traced over his signature that pledged his soul to the devil in an exchange for a long, healthy life. Apparently, the devil was finally here to collect his due. The handsome young man rolled the scroll shut and slid it back into his pocket. With a flourish, the man gestured for Tony to climb into the coach. Tony frantically looked around. Usually his clever tongue was good for getting him out of situations. But at this moment, his tongue cleaved to the roof of his mouth. The devil wanted to take him to hell. The handsome young man smiled. He snapped his fingers again. Behind him, Tony suddenly saw the girl, pale and thin, oozing sores around her sharp wrists where ropes had once bound her hands. The wind caught at her stained, ragged shift, her eyes wet and black and burning with malice. She held something in her arms, a writhing, purpled thing. Tony stepped back, but the handsome young man grabbed his arm. His grip was firm. The touch of his fingers seemed to singe Tony's skin. 
You can take your chances with them or come with me. The girl wasn't the only one. Tony looked around the courtyard. It was filled with ghosts of former prisoners, hundreds whose deaths he'd overseen. Dressed in rags, they stared at him. Some had gaping wounds, others burns. They shuffled nearer with clawed hands, wanting to... Tony wasn't about to find out. Tony climbed into the carriage. The young man sprang up after him. The carriage disappeared into the night, and Warden Tony was never seen again. Warden Tony served the court at Musham Castle for over 30 years, living unto a ripe old age. Legend has it that Tony made a deal with the devil in his youth, exchanging his soul for good health, which he used in the service of making people suffer. Some say Tony never died, but in honor of his cruel ways, was spirited away by the devil himself. The criminal court at Musham Castle operated up until 1790, when it was dissolved by the Archbishop. Afterwards, Musham Castle slowly began to fall into disrepair. In the early 1800s, confusion and terror once again gripped the Musham Castle region. Many deer and cattle were turning up dead. Suspecting that the supernatural was involved, some local villagers set out to do something about it. Noah grimly crouched over the cow, inspecting the gaping wound that spilled her innards across the ground. It was the third dead cow at their family's farm this fortnight. Noah's brother Franz spat on the ground and crossed himself. He thought it was a man turned wolf, killing for pleasure rather than hunger. At first, Noah had been skeptical of the old tales of bedeviled men who could transform into supernatural wolves. But with all the unusual killings happening in the area, he was beginning to believe. It had only taken a few pints at the pub and Franz's angry tongue to rile the villagers up. Several of his neighbor's cattle had gone missing too. It was time to find the wolf monster and there was only one place to start. They gathered at the gates of Musham Castle with torches and muskets, yelling for Joseph to come out. Joseph, the elderly hound master who was in charge of the hunting dogs at Musham. Joseph, who seemed to have an uncanny affinity for animals. Joseph, whom they whispered sometimes shed his human skin. Finally, the Musham guards worried that the mob would storm the castle. They sent Joseph out. Some of the villagers wanted to execute Joseph on the spot, but Noah and some other cooler heads prevailed. Noah, Franz, and their neighbor Marcus would transport Joseph to Salzburg for the authorities to question. It was a chilly, breezy night. A bright moon occasionally peeked from among the drifting clouds. The sway of the cart was hypnotic. Noah was beginning to drift off. Joseph's sudden howl sent shivers racing up Noah's spine. It startled the horses. Marcus pulled hard on the reins as the horses bucked. Joseph tumbled from the cart and took off running, headed into the midden woods. If Noah hadn't seen it himself, he never would have believed it. Joseph flexed as he ran, and the ropes binding his arms to his torso suddenly popped free. Franz ran after him. Marcus and Noah caught up with Franz near the edge of the woods. Noah handed Franz his musket. It didn't matter how far Joseph had gotten. Franz was the best tracker in the village, if not all of Salzburg. They'd find Joseph. As the night wore on, Noah became more and more anxious. The woods were unusually quiet. Something was wrong. But Noah couldn't put his finger on it. 
He told Franz and Marcus they should turn around, but neither of them would hear of it. Anxious, Noah whirled around, nearly dropping his musket. The others chuckled at his reaction. Keep a steady heart, brother, said Franz, clapping Noah on the back. Marcus had spied something up ahead in the woods. He put a finger to his lips and gestured for the others to smother their torches. As silently as possible, the men crept through the forest. Joseph stood in a small clearing, bared to the waist, ancient symbols scarred into his torso, chanting under the light of the moon. Joseph turned in the men's direction, and then it all happened so fast. Joseph fell to the ground, twisting and contorting. Tremors rippled under his skin. Franz rushed him, trying to tie him up. Joseph latched onto Franz's leg with clawed hands. He was shuddering, his face lengthened and growing furry. Franz tried to kick free and fell onto a huge gray wolf. Saliva dripped from its slavering jaws. Its yellow eyes seemed to glow with malice. Noah stopped at his tracks, stunned. Marcus tried to take aim, but he couldn't get a clear shot without hitting Franz. Franz and the beast wrestled, rolling on the ground. The wolf latched onto Franz's throat. Noah was galvanized into action. He surged forward, swinging his musket at the creature's head, stunning it. Franz struggled loose. Marcus aimed. The wolf collapsed, shot in the head. Its fur began to recede, and suddenly Joseph lay on the ground. Scratched, naked, blood streaming from his head. Franz lay next to him, trying to catch his breath. His hand, leg, and neck all streamed blood. Franz held up a trembling hand. His fingernails had turned black. They were sharpening, lengthening into claws. Franz's body was beginning to shudder. Marcus grabbed Noah before he could come any closer to Franz. Franz was panting now, rolling his eyes, becoming less human with every heartbeat. His lips drew back from his suddenly long teeth. Keep a steady heart, brother, Franz snarled. Franz reached out and grabbed the tip of Noah's musket pointing it at his own chest. Throughout the late Middle Ages, some men, usually elderly, professed to be wolf charmers. They performed spells or incantations and provided superstitious peasants with charms in order to keep wolves away. Some whispered that they had the power to control wolves, turn people into wolves at will, or become wolves themselves. In light of the hysteria over witchcraft, people became suspicious of these alleged powers, and many wolf charmers were executed as werewolf witches. When dead animals kept turning up, angry locals hunted for a wolf, but quickly came to suspect some Musham Castle residents of being werewolves. Curiously, Once the accused had been taken prisoner and executed, the mass animal killings in the area seemed to stop. Our story will continue in a moment after a brief message. And now, back to our story. After the state abandoned the property and the Musheimer family line died out, The castle was left to rot for over 50 years. In 1886, the Austrian explorer Count Johann Vilcek purchased Musham Castle from the state and restored it to its former glory. Count Vilcek filled the castle with his art collection, much of which he had personally collected during his various travels. Today, Musham Castle continues to be privately owned by the Vilcek family. 
In addition to allowing the castle to be used as a movie set, the Vilcek family has opened several rooms to the public, creating a museum display of Count Vilcek's art collection and artifacts from earlier times in the castle. Both visitors and staff at Musham Castle have had paranormal experiences with those caught between this world and the next. Anna jumped, caught off guard by the sudden thunder. Another one of those rapid summer thunderstorms was sweeping down from the hills. It had already been a slow day at the castle. Now with the rain, it was unlikely there would be any more tourists today. Right on cue, her boss called, telling Anna that she could lock up early if no visitors were there. Anna walked down the hall humming. It was only her second week, and the castle with its echoing maze of rooms and creepy history still made her a bit nervous. She had been warned by another staff member that sooner or later she would have some sort of unexplainable ghostly experience. She wasn't sure if they were serious or they were just trying to prank a newbie. Protocol was to walk through every museum room checking for errant guests before individually locking the rooms. Then she could set the alarm and leave. She started in henchman Tony's room, named so because it was part of the apartment that used to be his quarters. Some of his fine clothing was on display in glass cases. Reflected in the glass, Anna thought she saw someone sitting behind her at the table. Anna whirled around but no one was there. She laughed at herself. A tourist had told Anna that she saw henchman Tony sitting at this table, pondering the cruel decisions he had made during his life. Apparently, Anna's imagination was active. The hunting room always gave Anna the creeps. The wall full of antique guns, all those mounted animal heads with glass eyes that seemed to follow her every movement. Satisfied no one was there, Anna closed and locked the door. Anna paused. It sounded like someone was talking in the room. Anna flipped the lights on and gasped. The guns, every single one of them had been turned upside down. Anna couldn't think of a good explanation but she wasn't about to stick around and investigate. She snatched the keys up and hurriedly locked the door. The storm outside picked up as she checked and closed up a couple other rooms without incident. When Anna was in the waiting room, the chandelier buzzed and flickered overhead. But Anna firmly told herself that it was only the thunderstorm, and she believed it, mostly. Anna took a deep breath. She had one final room to check and close. The torture room. Definitely the scariest room in the whole castle. Even with all the lights on, the room still seemed dim, as if the terrible events that had occurred there cast a permanent pall. The cold stone floor was uneven, worn, darkened with stains, from God knows what. The centuries-old implements of torture, the rusty shackles that hung from the ceiling, the knives, tongs, and iron stamps for branding mounted on the rough-hewn walls, the stretching rack, the foot screw. Anna shuddered. Tourists were always fascinated by the room and wanted to take selfies posing in the stocks oblivious to the fact that someone had once pleaded for their life there. Anna nervously crossed the room to check the solitary confinement hole. There was a sudden clap of thunder, and the room went pitch black. Anna put out her hand and took a tentative step, feeling for the nearest wall. Somewhere near the door, there was an emergency flashlight. Anna cracked her shin on the stocks. It hurt, but at least she knew where she was. The downy hair on the back of Anna's neck prickled. She held her breath. 
For a moment, she thought she heard something. Something warm brushed against her cheek. Anna stumbled over a stool, but finally found the flashlight. She clicked it on. A woman stood in front of Anna. Her face was hideously burned, pink patches on her scalp where her hair had been singed down to the root. Her hand shot out to grab Anna's. It was warm. Anna struggled loose and ran for the door. She darted out of the room and slammed it shut behind her. She ran down the hallway, the small beam of light from the flashlight bouncing crazily from her motions. Behind her, the door suddenly sprang open. Anna glanced back as she rounded the corner. The ghost was floating along after her. All she had to do was make it to the vestibule. Anna turned back and surged forward. Suddenly, lightning struck, and in the split-second white glow, she could see more ghosts, not more than ten feet in front of her, blocking her way to the lobby. They began to drift toward her. Anna scurried into a side room at random and ran out the door on the far side. She'd go through the courtyard and double back around. The rain had slowed to a drizzle, and in the gloaming, Anna caught sight of several more ghosts. Anna began to sob. She wasn't going to be able to escape. She went back the way she came. As she stepped into the hallway, the lights came back on. The burned woman beckoned Anna to come. The crowd of ghosts surveyed Anna before silently parting to let her through. Anna held her breath as she passed between them, shuddering, even though warmth tingled through her skin. All the ghosts were horribly disfigured, burns, slit throats, skin and bones from starvation, bloody stumps where limbs should be. The burned woman walked on. Anna timidly followed, ready to flee. But the rest of the ghosts stayed a respectful distance behind Anna. They were hurting Anna somewhere. She wasn't sure where. She didn't know this part of the castle very well. Finally, Anna stood before a door. She tried the knob. It was locked. The burned woman touched the lock, and the door sprang open. Anna flicked on the lights and stepped inside. She was in a dusty, small chapel. The burned woman clasped her hands together. Anna looked up at the crucifix on the wall. That's when she understood. The spirits wanted Anna to pray for their souls. Musham Castle, party to the Salzburg Witch Trials, is haunted by the souls of those who were persecuted there. If you visit Musham Castle, don't be afraid of ghostly encounters. Sometimes the dead seek validation from the living. All they want is for their truths to be told. Thanks for listening to Haunted Places. A new episode comes out every Thursday. Listen to all of ParCast's podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, CastBox, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast directory. Many people ask how they can help the show. And if you enjoy Haunted Places, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you listen. We'll see you next week. Haunted Places was created by Max Cutler. It's a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It's produced by Max and Ron Cutler. Sound design by Ron Shapiro. With production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Haunted Places is written by Candace Rogers. I'm Greg Polson. And now, please enjoy this preview of mythology's first episode on the Greek goddess, Athena. 
it was foolish to challenge the gods. After battling the goddess Athena for three days, Enceladus had all but resigned himself to the fate of so many of his fellow giants. But he'd escaped her for the moment, and perhaps that would become his advantage. Enceladus had barely caught his breath when he heard the horses. He whipped around, worried Athena had tracked him to the Ionian Sea, but it was one of Enceladus' own, another giant. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face, dripping with blood. She kept the skin wrapped around her like a cloak. Enceladus's leg serpents snapped and spit at Athena, but their fangs couldn't pierce the hide of his own kind. It was a perfect shield. Athena knocked Enceladus into the Ionian Sea. Then she crouched down and lifted the entire isle of Sycolos. Athena had a divine, godly strength. Plucking an island out of the ocean was as easy for her as it was for a man to pick up his child. Athena straightened up, raising the island above her. She swung it around over Enceladus and slammed the island on his head. Enceladus crumpled under the blow of the island. He sank and then vanished beneath the landmass. His blood and anger rippled outward from the island. The place where Enceladus was defeated became Mount Etna, and the buried giant was reduced to expressing his wrath through eruptions and earthquakes. Yet something wasn't right. As she watched steam build above Mount Etna, Athena knew her heart was missing a piece. She'd used her wisdom and wit to defeat the enemy, embracing her role as a goddess of war, and it felt empty. She was destined for something greater, she was certain. Welcome to Mythology on the Parcast Network. Every Tuesday, we present dramatic stories from ancient mythology and explore their origins. I'm your host and narrator, Vanessa Richardson. Today, we're focusing on the Greek goddess Athena. She's the goddess of war and military strategy, but also the goddess of wisdom, civilization, and the arts. In her mythology, she's caught between who she is and who she wants to be. New episodes of Mythology release every Tuesday, and you can find us and all of Parcast's podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. At Parcast, we are grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help us. We also now have merchandise. Head to parcast.com slash merch for more information. Something to note in these episodes, all Greek myths have many versions and variations. We've selected those we felt are the most dramatic and entertaining, and supplemented them with additional research into Greek traditions. Additionally, each Greek myth takes place in a wide expanded universe. While we'll cover some major myths of Athena over the next few episodes, this won't be her only appearance in the podcast. Goddess of the arts and of war, Athena exhibits a dichotomy in Greek culture. She's a woman warrior in a culture where women didn't go to war, and a household goddess who vowed to never be a lover or a mother. Athena is masculine, feminine, and something greater than both. She's a goddess for everyone, 
and a goddess for no one. Ancient Greek society had clear gender roles, treating women as second-class citizens. But Athena exists outside that construct. She'll skin a giant alive and then go weave a tapestry. She's as apt to teach men gardening and pottery as she is to help them slay their enemies. Unlike her half-brother and rival, Ares, the war god, Athena approaches war with logic and meditation. At the start of a battle, Ares leaps into action, while Athena waits, plans, then leads men to bloody victory. She values rational thinking over emotion, but is not without rage and bloodlust. Classicist Walter F. Otto characterized Athena as the goddess of nearness because she was always beside the Greek heroes in battle, guiding their spears and swords. She is, like all Greek gods, a killer. However, Athena prefers to change errant humans into other forms, doling out punishments while preserving life. She also transforms herself taking a male appearance multiple times in the Iliad and the Odyssey. That isn't to say she doesn't embrace a female role, too. In today's myths, the building of the Palladium, the judgment of Paris, and the story of Arachne, Athena strives to be recognized as feminine. And this may be the hardest battle the goddess of war has ever fought. The king of the gods had a headache, and Zeus's son Hephaestus, like many children, was only making it worse. Hephaestus was god of the forge, born with a club foot. To him, a headache was nothing. And then I realized I could put another axe head on my existing axe and kill two men with one blow. Genius, right? Oh, my head is killing me. That's the idea. Both heads could kill. Two heads, one axe. Zeus gestured to his forehead, frustrated. It feels like my skull is expanding and contracting. Maybe I should go... Oh, oh headache. I thought we were still on axe heads. Zeus continued moaning as he dropped to the floor, gripped his head, and rocked back and forth. Hephaestus looked on, torn between sympathy and opportunity. Anything I can do? Maybe take over your duties for a time? Not that a headache could ever take down the great god Zeus. Oh, Hephaestus, will you... Oh. Hephaestus eyed his brand new double-headed axe. Then Zeus doubled over in front of him. The opportunity was ripe. Zeus had overthrown Hephaestus' grandfather. Perhaps patricide ran in the family. Oh, make it stop. End it. Cut off my head. Hephaestus hid his grin as he grabbed his double-head axe. After today, the gods of Mount Olympus would bow to Hephaestus. He wound up and aimed straight for Zeus's skull. The axe cleaved Zeus's head in half. As Zeus's eyes spread wide apart, a battle helmet emerged from where his brain should have been. Ah! Hephaestus dropped his axe in shock as a fully armored warrior woman sprang from Zeus's head, shouting a battle cry. All thoughts of ruling Mount Olympus faded in the face of this fearsome, beautiful goddess. Ready for battle, Athena stepped out of her father's head and into the light of Mount Olympus. Athena was born without a mother, the child of Zeus alone. She emerged a rational adult, capable of complex thought, and ready to fight for her life. Yet because the Greek gods are modeled on humans, with human flaws and emotions, there is one story of Athena's childhood and a youthful accident that guided the rest of her life. Zeus was accustomed to his children having a mother, so after he fused his head back together, he wasn't sure what to do with Athena. Eventually, the single dad sent his new daughter away to be educated by his nephew, Triton. Triton was a fish-tailed ocean god, so Athena spent much of her time in and around water, and more of her time with Triton's daughter, Pallas. Pallas was a water nymph, a maiden of the ocean, and Athena's only friend. 
But today, the war goddess and the water nymph raised their swords, squaring off against each other. The pair sparred on the surface of a lake. Pallas floated amid a column of waves, her long hair and shimmering fishtail distracting from her killer aim. Athena defended herself from atop a sleek raft, wearing armor as always. She pushed her sword forward, calling out her moves as she executed them. Striking, stabbing, dodging, ducking, and slicing. Lunging. As Pallas lunged, Athena used her shield to knock Pallas over. Rising from the waves, Pallas spit water into Athena's face. Hey! <laughs> Pallas spouted more water, somehow forming it into perfect concentric circles, like aquatic smoke rings. Athena couldn't help but laugh. Pallas, be serious. My father's coming to watch a spar tomorrow. We have to impress him. You have to impress him. If I impress him, you know where I'll end up. And my father won't be happy about that. You're filthy. You've heard the stories, and you have a hundred half-siblings to prove it. Thirty-seven. I have thirty-seven half-siblings. That's an army, warrior goddess. Let's go again. I want to get that spinning parry right. Athena was quite skilled in combat. It helped that she took to it naturally, like palace to water. She'd been ecstatic to hear Triton declare that they were finally good enough to spar in front of Zeus. The proud fathers had invited a crowd of gods, nymphs, and even a few mortals they fancied. Rowing out onto the lake, Athena fiddled with her helmet. She knew her armor made her look ferocious, but she still felt like a child in a woman's body. What if she fell off her raft? What if her mind went blank and she froze? What if her father, the king of the gods, thought she was only average? A terrifying column of water arose from the depths. Inside it, Pallas. She met Athena's eye and flashed a quick smile. Athena relaxed. She wasn't alone. She had Pallas. With her best friend beside her, Athena had nothing to worry about. They began to spar. In the audience, Zeus watched intently. Next to him, his wife Hera, the goddess of marriage, looked around, intent in a different way. Aphrodite has such a nice nose, don't you think? Sure. That's it. Slice and dodge. Well done. You've never noticed it? I guess it's fine, if you like noses. It looks quite like Athena's. Don't start on this again. I don't understand why you... She's going to fall in the water. A wave crashed over Athena, soaking her. Athena slipped, but kept her footing on the raft. Come on, Athena. You can do it. Get back up there. Raise that sword. You'll win this yet. They aren't actually fighting. It's a mock spar. At the end of which, my daughter will win. Zeus nervously watched Athena struggle through the next few maneuvers. She's going to fall and embarrass us. Us? She does have a mother. I knew it. I meant Athena and myself. As Zeus worried, Athena relaxed into the rhythm of the spar. She breathed deeply as she pressed her shield against Pallas's sword. Her instincts took over. Suddenly, a new heat rushed through Athena's veins. She'd never felt this warrior power before, but it possessed her. Her feet danced more nimbly. Her sword twisted more sharply. She tasted metal in her mouth. For the first time, she might want to kill. Across the lake, Zeus adjusted his shield. The sun gleamed off of it. Getting an idea, he tilted his shield, aiming the ray of light at Pallas. In the water, the light caught Pallas's eye. She looked up. Meanwhile, Athena stabbed toward Pallas's heart, a final flourish, the perfectly executed move she was born for. This was her gift, combat. Athena lunged, expecting Pallas to dodge as they had rehearsed. She didn't notice that Pallas's face was tilted up, distracted. Pallas looked toward Zeus as Athena's sword pierced her heart. 
Instead of blood, water flowed from Pallas's wound. She shrank, dissolving, until all that was left were her eyes, which transformed into two wiggling minnows. Pallas was dead. If you enjoyed listening to this preview of our episode on Athena and want to hear the rest of it, search and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes release every Tuesday.